watch it. Drink it in. Stupendous. The greatest moment I've seen. This is history being written. Amazing. Gol de Estados Unidos. Captain America. <laughs> One nil. Dude, the the awareness right there just to go get that rebound. It goes back to that energy we were talking about. The youth, the energy, just staying involved in the play. Oh, love it. Welcome back to the Footy Fetish Show where the fetish is real, the footy is soccer. With us today, we've got Brandon Cohen, a.k.a. Turd Ferguson, our resident referee. How are you, Brandon? I'm doing well. Better now than... I was a couple minutes ago. <laughs> Ain't that the truth? We saw Pulisic Sky one over the top, and then he redeemed himself putting one in the back of the net. So for those tuning in, all those millions of people, it's just zero. We've, uh, we're, we're watching the USA game live right now, and we're going to do our transfer market update, as well as get Brandon's opinion on Liverpool for this offseason. I think they've got – a pretty interesting summer ahead of them. We've already seen them make one move in uh, Alexis McAllister. I think that was a fantastic move, if I might add. Uh, Huge. We'll, we'll get right into it. I'm going to quickly get into some rumors that's been going around the horn today. So, welcome back to 90 Seconds with Total 90. Starting off, we've got some more information about Mbappe in the French League. PSG has released an official statement saying that they will either sign a new deal with Mbappe or put him up for sale this summer. If he does not want to make any intention of signing a new deal, he will be up for sale. Moving over to the Syria A, Davide Fratesi, the youngster from Sassuolo, has popped on the radar for Inter. Talks are ongoing about whether or not he is up for a loan or purchase. Also in Serie A, we've got two players leaving Juventus on the free. Juan Cuadrado and Danilo have both not extended their contracts with Juventus. Those are going to be some really sleepy picks for any team who picks them up. They still have the energy and the quality to make any team they go on much better. I would honestly love to see Milan go after them because these boys have Champions League experience. They've got national team experience. I don't I wouldn't too. I wouldn't worry too much about the age there. Over in La Liga, we've got Barcelona showing interest in Joao Cancelo. This would require a fee to Man City, but talks ongoing there. Also got some updates with Declan Rice between Arsenal and West Ham. Arsenal has sent an eighty million dollar request. West Ham said they want something closer to to a hundred mil. Looking like it'll be closer, probably to ninety ninety five. Jude Bellingham has also been settling in at La Liga. He just had his first press conference stating that he went to the best club in the world and that the Real Madrid versus Liverpool Champions League final really helped him make his decision. Sorry about that, Brandon. Just reading his words. <laughs> also, <laughs> uh, also in the Serie A, we've got the issue of Dejan Kulicevsky, who's on loan to Tottenham. The fee that is currently being talked about right now is $35 million. Tottenham do want to buy him outright. And last but not least, over in Syria, we've got Gio Simeone, who is a Verona striker on loan at Napoli. Napoli has triggered his $12 million clause. Makes me wonder, does that mean OC Men is on the move? I don't know. We'll find out. As far as players, that's all we got for Syria, but... We have just been announced a new head coach for Napoli. Napoli will be signing Rudy Garcia from Lille, uh, currently at Nice, but he was with that Lille team that helped win um, uh, Ligue 1, I believe. I'd have to double-check that one. But Napoli will be signing Ru Rudy Garcia from the French League. One more signing I need to mention over in the EPL. Not a signing, but uh, a rumor is Moises Caicedo from Brighton. Chelsea has been in talks with this player for quite a while. I believe uh, Fabrizio Romano said this has been a month to two-month ongoing negotiation. We know that De Zerbi asked him specifically to not go in January and stay with the club for the second half of the season. And you can see why 
they are back in European play. Congrats to Brighton. That'll do it for 90 seconds with total 90. Now it's time for some roundtable talk. Brandon, give us the latest yes, sir. on Liverpool. How are they looking in this offseason? What are some moves that you expect to see? Man, I've heard so many rumors this offseason about Liverpool going after some players, defense, midfield. It's bringing me a little, a little bit of buzz. I'm really appreciating it. I mean, it's kicking off the transfer market with the signing of a World Cup champion, Alexis McAllister, brilliant season with Brighton and Hove Albion. I mean, that team, that scouting department, they really put it on this season. They were a pleasure to watch. That uh, like 17-year-old from Ecuador, yeah. I believe, and CISO, he's brilliant. The Japanese guy, Matoma, amazing. Like you said, Caicedo. I mean, they had a great team all around. And the coach. And the coach, that's right. The gaffer. The gaffer. What are some uh, what are some positions? Is there a backline rumor on the way? Um, I, I I think Kanate will shore up that defense. We're gonna get rid of Joe Gomez possibly, so I'd like I'd like to see a replacement uh, for a potential center back. Um, there's rumors about TAA possibly going to Madrid. I don't see that happening. The boys the scouts are through and through. <laughs> uh, Andy Robertson rumors too. Keep keep the Scotsman at Anfield. That guy is brilliant. So in forward though, we got to replace Firmino. Ooh, interesting. What are your thoughts on uh, Nunez, Darwin Nunez? Is he is he someone that could be the the guy at Liverpool, or does he need more time? He could be. I think a lot of my friends have given me a lot of smoke about that signing. I I mean, based on his production, we may have overpaid. Uh, so I'll give you that one, but that man doesn't stop running. He really sets up a lot of create creative plays, and sometimes they don't result in goals. Maybe his finishing isn't great, but he didn't have a full season with the squad, so this will be his first full year at Liverpool, and I, I fancy the Uruguayan to have a, a solid campaign, maybe 15 goals, 10 assists. I can estimate the transition that it that is required when going from one league to the best league which is the EPL the quality the talent the physicality it's just another level you can't duplicate that anywhere and it's not until you play in that league do you really get to understand uh what's what's required of you would you say that's that's accurate yeah I mean I'm not good enough to play in the EPL but <laughs> I will take your word for it <laughs> yeah, you know, my, my days in the EPL, they were short numbered, but uh, I can tell you from experience, it was not easy. <laughs> I quickly want to kind of look at the uh, the ratings here. I don't know if you can see on my screen. I've got the ratings for Liverpool looking just at, you know, your your top 11 here. Leading, of course, Mohamed Salah, TAA is in second, Cody Gakpo. I mean, talk about someone who quickly transitioned to the EPL. This guy being as young as he is, 23, 24, I thought he had a really good season, as well as a steal for Liverpool. I don't think y'all played, y'all paid too much for him, right? What was the? Do you remember the price tag? I think it was around forty mil, but I'd have somebody could fact check me on that. Let's check it. Cody Gakpo. I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but I am a who scored slut, as well as. There is just a wealth of information on all of these websites, whether you want to know ratings or transfer markets, values, 42 million euros. Nice. And he was, uh, his market value was 60 million when you guys bought him. Fuck. Nice. I mean, he had a great World Cup. He did. Totally demolished the United States of America. <laughs> uh, just all around solid campaign. Yep. I remember you had him on your fantasy team. I was a little jealous. Yep. Second pick overall for me. Right. My second rounder. Looking at uh, – so I quickly went back to these, these top 11. Darwin Nunez rounded out the top nine. He was ninth on the team for Liverpool with a 6.79, tying Ibrahim Kanati. If those two players just bump up their ratings as far as, you know, their performance on the field, if they just bump it up like maybe half a point, Maybe put themselves at like a 7.3. Man, 7 point. How about just a 7.1, a 7.2? That will drastically improve Liverpool. And that will help, Agreed. help we, the tape. We gave up too many goals last season. 
That was our problem, just leaking goals. Let's take a look at that. And for those tuning in, we are currently watching USA versus Mexico. It has just reached halftime, 1-0 to the good guys, the red, white, and blue. Liverpool rounded out in fifth place. I didn't know they finished. They, they were able to grab that fifth place. Yeah, we just uh, missed out on Champions League. I've been hearing it nonstop. How's the Europa League going to feel? Thursdays, baby. Thursdays it is. I will say, though, if we're looking at goal differential, you guys did not have that bad of a season. You did score 75 and you let in 47. If we compare that to the other top four teams, you actually are in third place as far as goals scored. And then goals against, you guys were the the most, but only by four goals. Manchester United and Arsenal both let in 43, Liverpool allowing 47. So when we really look at it like that, um, not too shabby, not to mention your goal differential was plus 13 over Manchester United. So nothing, nothing, of course, to be proud about. But, I mean, like you said, if Konate can improve and maybe – Darwin Nunes can score a few more goals, then you really stretch that goal differential out, maybe get into like 35, 40. So anything is possible for Liverpool. Hopefully they make some good signings this summer. You're right. How about that 7 nothing win against Manchester United? That was the game of the season for me. That was the tits, man. I enjoyed that thoroughly, and I don't even have a dog in the fight. It was just fun soccer to watch. <laughs> you know what I have to say, though? I was a little upset because uh, I was – I was doing really well in fantasy that year or that week, that game week. And Liverpool played late in the weekend. I might have been like uh, Sunday, Sunday, like later. I don't know what was going on, but I woke up Sunday morning. I was like, fuck yeah, I'm in the top 10. By the end of the day, I had been bumped out to like the top 50 because everybody had Liverpool players. And it just seemed like everybody was scoring goals. I was just like, oh man, I went from top 10 to top 50 just one game, 7-0. Assists, goals, I mean, the works. It was it was heartbreaking, but fun to watch as a soccer fan. So props to you guys for getting that 7-0 off. I kind of want to no ask doubt. your opinion about um, the Champions League final. Being that you are a very high, highly qualified ref, what was your thoughts on the refereeing during that final? Yeah, I mean, the elephant in the room is the potential handball, right? Or is... It's called in the laws of the game handling, but we all can call it a handball. Um, that, that guy, he's Polish, I believe. He ref the World Cup final in December. Lionel Messi, Mbappe, France coming back, going into penalty kicks. I mean, that was an epic game for the ages. I thought he did a great job that game. I thought he did a great job overall in uh, the Champions League final in Istanbul. Uh, can we shout out 2005 Istanbul Liverpool coming back against uh, Hugh Bartlett? No, well, that's not fair. Everybody, guys, we gotta go. I'll talk. No, props to you guys, man. Three nil. Wow, what a fucking comeback. I, uh, I, I'm gonna be honest. I actually did not get to watch that one live, and thank God because I probably would have just been in the bathroom crying for the rest of the day. I mean, jeez, three nil. You really think you won the game at three nil? But damn, props to you guys, man. Yeah, props to you guys. Hey, how? Shout out Scott Carson, backup goalkeeper for Liverpool in 05 in Istanbul, backup goalkeeper for Man City in 2023 in Istanbul. <laughs> Still, you know, it's funny. He's he's won two Champions League trophies and Tottenham, <laughs> like Tottenham, Arsenal, like, and all that time, <laughs> nothing, nothing. It, yeah. What a story from Scott Scott Carson. It's, what uh, What's that chant about Tottenham? What do you think of Tottenham? Oh, shit. shit. What, do you what do you think of shit? Tottenham. We ain't Tottenham. We ain't Tottenham. We ain't Tottenham. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That's a lovely, lovely chant. That's, you know, speaking on the topic of chants in the USA, we need so much help in that department. We can't come up with a fucking chant to save our lives. Are you mean to tell me the USA's best chant is I believe that we will win. That's like that's our peak. That's all we can do. It's a shame. It's embarrassing. And you know what? We've got some bangers in the locker, some tunes. You got Yankee Doodle, right? Yankee Doodle had it. Like you can easily take some American names and players and just 
sing it over that tune. That's all the Europeans do. They find familiar tunes and they just replace it with their players. There's the famous one for Liverpool. Um, Mont, uh, Sala. Do, 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 do. Oh, money, oh money, money, money. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Instant but classic. we sold Coutinho. But we have Firmino. <laughs> but that's okay. How about a du- got Dua Lipa? Loves Liverpool. We got a one kiss is all it takes. Yeah. I mean, that you got uh, Milan is another one. They have the Piolis on fire. Purely oh, yeah. by, I mean, they just like, why can't we figure that out? We are a country that produces so much great music, yet we can't make a good chant in soccer? Like, come on, fellas. I think uh, Shit. what happened the other day after Messi signed for Inter Miami is just kind of a microcosm of Americans not knowing enough about football. Some Some talk show guy on, like, national news, major news station, mentioned like David Beckham learned English when he came to play in America and he was like Messi needs to learn English he doesn't speak English and David Beckham put out the effort to learn English the dude's British <laughs> what he's got yes. control I mean this clip this clip was all over Twitter I'm like god this is so embarrassing oh, he's got to he's got to be trolling that can't be real that can't be real. yeah He's got to be. Messi does need to learn English, though. If he's going to be here for two and a half years, we want to hear him talk. I want to hear him, like, express how he feels about playing against Seattle Sounders, you know, like the atmosphere. What are your thoughts about playing in that stadium? What What about Atlanta United? That's a really big stadium. I think he's going to. I've been, I've watched uh, a couple former teammates who made it to the MLS play at both uh, CenturyLink or Lumen Field in Seattle about 67,000 fans, and then I also saw him play against Atlanta United in the Mercedes-Benz Superdome, about 63,000 fans at that game. Ooh. Pretty epic. Like, more fans than Atlanta Falcons NFL game. I've heard that. I've heard that. What about the the energy and the, the like, the crowd noise? Do they bring it? Oh, Yo, yeah. <sighs> Seattle's got a great fan base. Oh, man. I need see that's that's one of my bucket lists. I've got some people out in Atlanta that they know, of course, that I love soccer, and they're like, "Man, you got to come out to an Atlanta United game. It's just the atmosphere is, it's just indescribable. You got to just experience it. It's like, man, you do. I gotta get out. I got, I got broads in Atlanta. <laughs> codes <laughs> in different area codes. I believe is the that's uh, right the song as it goes. So we were talking before the podcast, and I really wanted to 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 get what you were saying onto the podcast because I really liked the content. And we were specifically talking about, um, in this game specifically, not to you specifically too much, but the USA was playing Mexico and there was a foul that was kind of soft. And immediately you, you called that out as soft, but then kind of followed it up by saying, as a ref, you kind of have to set a tone. Can you just kind of elaborate on that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, good question. Uh, in a game with big emotions on the line, like a knockout match, it's quarterfinal, semifinal, round of 16, a rivalry, you know, intracontinental rivalry, um, you know that they're going to go at it the first few minutes. They want to establish their dominance. It's a chess game. And so that first foul, you can't, you can't be soft. You really got to lay on the whistle. You got to run to the spot. You got to puff your chest out a little bit, point your arm really strong, look everybody in the eye. Give them that confidence. Hey, I got this, gentlemen. We're going to have a good game today. And then you can kind of gain some respect. And then you can kind of ease off and fade into the background and let the players do what they do best. It, it's truly best when a ref is not recognized. Wow. Well said. That is a great point. And people don't really appreciate that. When you forget that the ref is on the field, that's when you know he's really got control of the game. I appreciate that. There was something else that you had mentioned, and it just slipped my mind. We were talking about um, how you as a ref, you need to control the game. And, uh, I mean, if you could just share your story about how you learned that, would that would you be okay sharing that story? Yeah, about uh, tactics with referees. Yes. Yeah, yeah this is your early days, right? right? You're, this is like young Brandon Cohen, up and coming. Yeah. Yeah, I was climbing the ranks up the 
the refereeing uh, chain and uh, traveling the country, going to all the different tournaments, adult games, semi-pro, et cetera, youth games. And uh, I was refing a USL match, and first foul, I mean, everybody in the stadium knew it was a foul. Easy call. Nobody argued. Uh, you know, blew the whistle, tweet, pointed, and, you know, that was that. And then uh, on all those big games, you have a former professional or a current professional ref that's watching you and taking notes and especially paying attention to match critical incidents like goal, no goal, offside, onside, uh, red card, you know, potential denying obvious goal scoring opportunities. So they're looking out for those things, but they also critique you on some of the smaller things. And after the game, he sat me aside and was like, hey, you got that call right, but that was your chance to establish your presence. You should have ran to the spot of the foul, put the ball down, look everybody in the eyes, hold your arm out nice and firm. It was right in front of the benches, so you could have gained a little um, credibility with both coaching and technical staffs there. So I thought it was a good point. And so I always tried to put that into my game as I ref a few more years, uh, you know, at the top level. So This is something that if you're not in that world, you would never recognize. But now that you say this, it's absolutely apparent that – when there is a rivalry or a really big knockout game and that there's a lot there's a lot of stake at at this game the referees on that first call they, they it's almost like a like a performance like they they it doesn't look fake but you can tell that they're they're intentionally hard whistle firm actions it's not like a soft arm it's a very rigid firm arm and their their posture their body language is very confident like you said they've got control of the game and that every they, they're trying to let it be known stuff like that until you said it i didn't really fully like you don't notice that you just kind of take it for granted you're like oh this is a good ref he's got control of the game but that that's something that he he is intentionally doing it's not necessarily his personality if, if you see that guy off the field he's not like this big macho bravado guy but he, in order to really control the game he's got to kind of behave in that way to really set the tone uh, that's that's a fantastic perspective that I would have never realized without you know that um without that story. So yeah, and you know we wear the radios and we have the beeper flag. What? Uh, oh. and so what I always what I always say to my my team of referees, the assistant refs, and the fourth official, hey, it's a rule of five. So the first five minutes of the first half, first first five minutes of the second half, last five minutes of each half. Mm. And then five minutes after a goal, you really got to increase your attention span, increase your concentration, because that's when things tend to blow up. That is another one that, I mean, as soon as you say it, you're like, of course, that makes sense. But, you know, as a player, uh, I'm not paying attention to that. But, you know, at the same time, when a goal is scored or first five minutes, last five minutes, that's when the the emotions really start to elevate and, and everyone's starting to really kind of kind of make poor decisions and that's where the referee is that's that's their job to really kind of control the emotions do you feel like playing at a high level yourself helped give you more of a, a perspective as a referee as well oh Hugh I mean yeah I'm gonna retweet that there I coming up the ranks I mean I, I got to work with some really special people and I still consider them friends to this day you know they give me tickets to MLS games. A lot of people I was traveling the country with are now in the MLS. Like Several of them have their FIFA badges. And, uh, you know, whenever we're in the same city, they'll, they'll give me tickets to their game. It's real. It's a, it's a brotherhood. It's a sisterhood, you know, for the female refs. It, it's great. But um, I, I have to agree with you. Playing, playing since I was a little kid, traveling the country, you know, it, it gives you such a different perspective because you can teach the technical aspects you know, the different tonation of your whistle, um, your body language, your posture, how to communicate with players. You know, there's the, the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. And a lot of refs that didn't grow up playing this, the game, they were a little too tight, rigid with the laws of the game. And they didn't know how to bend the rule book a little bit and match the emotions that or associated with the game. One of the things, and, and just to piggyback, one of the things that you've told me in the past was you use the phrase, the spirit of the game, or like the spirit of the environment. 
And I'm just, that kind of like lines in perfectly. If you're not, if you haven't played at that level, you haven't played in like a championship game or you haven't played at like a, a rivalry game, you don't understand the player's perspective. And sometimes, like you said, you got to bend the a little bit to allow the spirit of the game and kind of the, the theatrics of it to really kind of flow and, and allow that just just the the beautiful game to kind of express itself and and you know I was hoping you'd give an answer like this because I've always wondered when when you have a ref and and he's sitting there making calls or the way he's handling the game you're like has this guy ever actually played or is he you know and but sometimes you get a ref and you're like okay this dude he knows exactly what the fuck is going on he's played clearly like you can just tell by the way he moves on the field he can kind of read the play as well. Like, and he know he can almost read the play and go, okay, I need to get over here so that I don't get in the way because I see where this is going. Would you say that that as well also helps? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, you, by knowing the game and I played, you know, in the middle of the park. So I, I felt like I knew how to position myself pretty well um, throughout the game. And, uh, get out of uh, passing channels. That was really important. Mm. A ref getting hit with the ball is like <laughs> the worst, the most embarrassing. You never want to get hit with the ball. <laughs> I've always wondered if they had like a side course that was like dodgeball for refs. Like in order to get your referee course, you had to go through like a, almost like a run the gauntlet. Like you got to run through while people are kicking soccer balls just to prove you can like quick reflexes. Because I mean, sometimes the ref is just absolutely helpless, but you see him like, Take that dodge. You're like, whoa, this guy's moving. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, you know, just like example, if a team, it's a championship or elimination game, a team's losing 2 nothing, and, you know, one of their best players, you can, you can tell who's getting frustrated on the field. You know he's going to go make a foul. So you stay close to that guy. <laughs> you kind of talk him through the foul yeah. so he knows that you're right there, and you can almost prevent a yellow card from happening. Really? In your career, how many red cards have you given? <laughs> uh, I, I've given a few. Um, high school refereeing tends to have more yellow cards, uh, more narrower field, so there's more contact and less skilled players versus more skilled players. Interesting. That, uh, in, that inequality of skill tends to uh, create a little more violence, but uh, I really tried my best to keep those cards in the pocket. Love that mentality. And one more question. Give me your prediction for the final score of this USA-Mexico game. Dos a cero. Dos a cero. That'll do it for tonight. Do you have a quick shout-out before we officially close this podcast out? Yeah, of course. Uh, same shout-out I gave last time. We give a shout-out to uh, Saad, the Lakeview Legends. Um Two, two of my best friends that didn't grow up playing soccer, but they are true fans of the of the game of footy that we all love. Mm -hmm. And they they really fell in love with the game. There it is! Come on, boys! Yes! Beautiful, beautiful way to close out the pod. Talk about movie. I don't need no stinking movie when I got Dos Acero on my fucking screen. Let's go, boys. Woo!